All right. Hello. <laughs> My name is Adriana Mitchell. I'm Calvin Leon Smith. And we are both actors in Fat Ham saying hello to the TDF community. Yes. Um, so we're going to interview each other so we can learn a little more what we probably already know about Because <laughs> we're going on a year of doing this together. Yeah. Um, so, yes, we're so excited that um, to be a part of this Broadway debut of this beautiful play, Fat Ham. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other thoughts? Well, just before we get like officially started, I yes. am uh, a dark skin black man yes. with a fade haircut, yes. fresh haircut. I have on a white um, sleeveless shirt with a uh, stainless steel chain and earrings. Uh, I am a caramel mm. black woman with Fulani braids um, with purple ends, thanks to Opal. Um, I have some square hoops on. I have a kind of chartreuse um, spring dress on with a collar. And um, yeah. Yeah. Our background is like a little bit of a, I don't even know what this is. Like a peach, peachy, peachy like stucco is yeah. inspired thing and we're sitting on a, like a very muted gray booth yes and we're at the american airlines theater on yes. the on the uh little lounge area so that's where we are on the old broadway the old broadway okay let's jump right into these questions you ready? oh well okay. i would like to say too i play larry oh yes in fat ham what do we play <laughs> and and adriana uh me i play opal in fat ham so we play brother and sister in the yeah. play. And kind of like the parallels to uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet, it's kind of like Laertes. Yes, and, and then Opal is like the parallel to Ophelia yeah. in the play. Okay, now we'll now get into the we questions. Can... <laughs> we can do it now. <laughs> we can do it now. Okay, uh, do you want to read the first one? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, just days before Fat Ham premiered at the Public Theater, it won the 2022 Pulitzer Prize for Drama. What did you think of James Imes' play when you first encountered it? Oh my God, when I first read it, I had no idea it was going to win the Pulitzer. Um, um, but I really felt like it was just like, it was, it felt like a, like home. Like it's a play that um, reminds me of Atlanta, Georgia. I know it's set in North Carolina, but it's, it's a Southern black play or Southern black spin on Hamlet. So when I read it and I read these people, I was like, oh my God, I'm in Mobile, Alabama with my family at the family reunion at the Quality Inn outside. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just so many things. I just gave too much information to my family. <laughs> um, but it's, it gave it gave me and that that home feeling of just, of just all kinds of chaos and a good time and karaoke and foolishness that happens at a Black family cookout. Say so, that. Yeah. Yes, no, it reminded me. I uh, I grew up in Texas for just a little bit, but then my family moved to um, Memphis. So I spent most of my childhood in Memphis. Mm -hmm. So I got separated from my um, my more extended family where we used to do like barbecues and family reunions. Still went back to family reunions every once in a while. Mm -hmm. But um, when I read the play, I was so sold on Larry. I just yes. thought he had this really great arc. I uh, gotta be careful not to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he's got a beautiful arc. Mm -hmm. And I was really sold. I, I mean, I always feel like it's so rare that these queer characters, um, just like in any writing, whether it's in television, theater, there's like a lack of depth a lot of times mm -hmm. and complexities. Mm -hmm. And I'm always looking for that when I'm auditioning for things. And I mean, the the script itself with all the other characters like we know these people yes we know these people in our families we know these people our neighbors mm -hmm. friends um so it was a it was quite an easy sell yeah. i must i gotta I say yeah you know good writing calls to you it really does so. especially because i feel like too i'm so picky it's good to be picky because then you do things that that align with you yeah but then um, you also don't work that much you know it's <laughs> but okay. when you do it's you great love it. exactly <laughs> The power of your no to all actors watching. Mm -hmm. The power of your no. Say yes to the things that you feel are right for you. That part. Nice tangent. Let's do another question. <laughs> <Next> question. <laughs> you originated your roles off Broadway at the Public Theater. Yes, we did. Yes. How has Fat Ham evolved since last year's run? Mm. You know, it has in very minute ways for me. Yeah. And in ways that um, I guess I would say they don't necessarily feel like they lend itself to the storytelling because the story was already there, mm -hmm. but it feels like a, a little je ne sais quoi. Ooh. Just like more money equals more problems, but mm -hmm. also we're getting more uh, quality illusions yes. or yes, yes, yes. Um, 
you know, certain costumes have like elevated a little bit. Yeah. I think uh, I'll let you speak to this, but I do want to make a point that you got some really great text added. Yes, um, I did. That is just gorgeous. Um, I don't know if you want to speak on that. I but, do. Yeah. So I think probably the biggest transition for us was going from a thrust space to a proscenium, a proscenium space. So I think that changed the intimacy of the play, but I think we've still captured the intimacy of people the play. People keep saying this. The people yeah. who keep coming back um, twice, three times, keep saying that the intimacy hasn't been lost. And that was like a big fear of mine. It was, because we used to have lawn chairs on the lawn in the <laughs> set. So you could sit with us at yeah. the barbecue, basically. Um, but one other really um, important point um, that Calvin mentioned is that Opal got some, some softness. Mm -hmm. I think um, all of the characters, we won't speak too much because we have to see the play. All of the characters have something to share um, and something to realize and to um, orient orient themselves to. And they are putting on masks and face. And I think it's really great to have Opal have some language that I think just lets us into her a little bit more. And James mm -hmm. is brilliant. And I think I, it's the honor of my life that we workshop this play it was already finished. It already won the Pulitzer in its own right, but he was still open to us. He's a such a humble and uh, an observant playwright. Um, egoless. And, and egoless and just really saw what we were doing. And he said he learned about the characters from watching us do it. And so Opal got a little more juice. And it's amazing what those two lines can do. Really, people like really a, resonate with those, yeah. those new moments. And so we won't say what they are. We'll just see when you all see it, you can let us know. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll okay. do the next question, Kevin. Gotcha. Uh, your characters are grappling with some huge identity issues. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what are the challenges of playing trauma and humor side by side? Ooh, that's, that's a, good a really good one. That's a Cynthia Rebo kind Q of a question. question. It is. Um, oh, God. You know, I think it's twofold. Like, I think that there's like the life, like the socio, I mean, like the socio political aspect of it, of like, uh, what does it mean as like an actor to like take this kind of work on it? And, you know, for me personally, playing a character that's pretty close to my own lived experience, that mm -hmm. has been a challenge and playing it alongside. And I play essentially like the straight character who doesn't, who isn't comedic mm -hmm. and doing that alongside all these brilliant comedic acting folks. I want to call you guys acting comedic actors because you do every y'all well, we all do everybody all. Yes. yeah they're amazing so i don't want to be like these comedic actors but in the purpose of the play they are comedic mm -hmm. comedic actors um that can be hard because i'm also not getting the immediate gratification from the laughter of audiences mm -hmm. that can be because I, and then it's like all ego being like am i doing a good job i can't know because I'm not, you know if I, so that yeah. can be a challenge in its own right but i think it's more of a gift than a challenge. Um, I got to see the play because I broke out in hives at the public <laughs> on our last day during the matinee. And I have to say, like, the beauty of the play is playing these two things, humor and trauma side by side, because you don't have an opportunity to sit in one too long. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That was beautiful what you said. I think it's so fun because I think it's complex. It's 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 who black people are, you know. I think, yeah. and it's who it's who human beings are. We don't sit in anything for too long. Like mm -hmm. I think when you go, I think about the last time my family got together at a funeral, we were, you know, crying at the actual formal ceremony, and then we were at the reception drinking and playing spades and trying to have a good time. Like I think it's everything has to have complexity and duality, and I think that's what's so beautiful about what James has written is that there is an opportunity to go Greek, to go dig in deep down and, and stay there and be kind of, and leave heavy. But he, I read, I heard him say at a talk back recently that he stopped writing plays with sad endings. And so mm -hmm. I think he's interested in like an Afrofuturist um, or joyful experience um, in his writing. And so for me, you know, I, I feel like I'm still sharpening my comedic chops. And so this was an <laughs> opportunity to do that. And I think one of the most amazing things was when I auditioned for the play, and I was still trying to figure out the tone and if I got it right. And then I came in there and Sahim 
bust out laughing at me. <laughs> I said, oh my God, I'm funny. <laughs> this is funny. It's funny. Okay, it's funny. <laughs> okay, great, 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 great. okay, great. Um, because I was like, okay, this could be like I think there's a million ways that you can play James's work. I think he he throws lots of jokes in there, but there's also this like because it is it is it is complex, it's not just like boom punchline, boom mm. punchline. It's definitely something like the scene is ha- something that's happening. There's a moment between two people, mm. they're connecting, they're trying to connect, or they're missing each other. And and so there's lots of layers in the play. So I think it's just it's it's joyful to kind of sink our teeth into to get it to is. have both of those things. And you do have funny moments that have me cracking up on. Oh, uh, well, they're never intentional. <laughs> <laughs> and that's But I get it, but I hear what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. So we'll talk to we'll talk about that later, I think. Um, when we cast each other. <laughs> Great, yeah, we'll talk about that. Yes, okay. Next question. Uh, is it me? Oh, it's me. Uh, <laughs> Bad Ham is a radical riff on Hamlet. Yes. How much Shakespeare have you done? Mm. And do you and do you think Shakespeare's plays need to be reinvented to remain relevant? Wow, yes, I've done a ton of Shakespeare. <laughs> and I, I don't mean to do so much, but sometimes that's just what I end up doing. I've done Measure for Measure, Twelfth uh, Twelfth Night. Have I done Twelfth Night? I've done scenes from Twelfth Night. Uh Romeo and Juliet, Taming of the Shrew, I've done twice, I believe. I've done a lot of Shakespeare. I've done Hamlet. I did Hamlet with John Douglas Thompson playing Hamlet back at oh, ACT. And I played, I understudied Ophelia and played the player queen. I love Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare, I feel like, is is kind of what theater feels like to me. It feels like what this house is. It's just like, it's so grand. It's so um, effervescent and huge. And it just calls you to fill it up. And mm. I think that's what I love about Shakespeare. And what I love about reinventing Shakespeare, um, specifically as a Black woman is I think that that creates room for us. I think we can kind of assess plays like Othello that use a lot of dark and light imagery. We can look at Romeo and Juliet with a lot of dark and light imagery and really explain, okay, in this context, this is probably what he meant, but let's take this and make it Mm -hmm. more appropriate or make it more um, accessible from from a modern perspective. I think it's useful. I think there are some plays that I think we should maybe put down um, because even when they, I've seen them reinvented many ways and they still feel a little weird. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the point that Shakespeare was doing. He's creating something to create that, um, experience in us and that it maybe had that experience even then. Who knows? Now that you're saying this, I'm like, why every time I walk into a room mm-hmm. that I'm doing a Shakespeare play, like rehearsal room, and the first thing people like to say is like, this is a problem play. Okay, so why are we still doing this play that <laughs> feels undone? It right. feels like it wasn't it yeah. wasn't really fully fleshed out, but we're still giving it this reverence that feels so odd to me yeah. that we don't give that same permission to contemporary playwrights. I think that's, that's weird. That's so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I love Shakespeare though, but it's fun to play with. And I think James has done a brilliant job of taking the bones of what he wants and throwing out the rest and creating something entirely new. Yeah, I, I've i done quite a bit of Shakespeare. I think in grad school I did oh, yes, at school. least four. Four, and then I did one outside since graduating, mm-hmm. um, which was Macbeth. Okay. Or not since oh, graduating. I did, I did that dream. while I was in school. I did that while I was in school. Um, but I, I don't think that I'm sold on the idea that it needs to be reinvented to be relevant. Mm. Because I think all stories, I, I think something that I do believe that people do say about Shakespeare is that his stories are universal. I think they're based on archetypes as all stories actually, in my beliefs, uh, I think all stories are based off of archetype. Yeah. And I think it it depends on like how we, how any one society views said archetypes at any given time. Yes. Um, yes. That's such a great point. Right. But, you know, do we need, do I need to see like a fellow like hit a white woman on stage? No. 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 I don't think I need to see that. Um, <laughs> that's look, one of the places I'm like, okay, <laughs> we can let it go. Right. <laughs> um, and to be honest, like, I like Shakespeare when people are willing to like, to your point, take a phrase, take a take some stanzas and like make it mean something else. Mm. I just happen to enjoy that. And I also happen to enjoy the purity of like, just like doing it as close to, you know, what it was, which we can't ever really fully recreate. But yeah. I don't mind. I don't mind it. And I think both have the idea of reinventing and the idea of keeping it 
um, how it was originally intended. I think both have their purposes. Agreed. And I think I like both for different reasons. Hmm. Not that anybody asked me what I liked, but- They did yeah. ask you. <laughs> they asked us. That was the question. Okay. okay, okay. Next. We're so talkative. <laughs> uh, you're both making your Broadway debuts in Fat Ham. Woo! Was Broadway always a dream? Oh, you're asking. I'm asking. Uh, oh. No, it wasn't. Really? Really. Oh my God, that's one of my lines. I think about like my, my trajectory and my brain about what oh, I, like what were my stimuluses to be an actor were like I can kind of track like when I first said oh I want to major in acting I was a junior mm. in college and I said um I only I just was like I don't want to work for the rest of my life that was the dumbest thing I that was the most ignorant thing I could have said acting is very hard work yes it um is. <laughs> Uh, but that was like my first impetus was like, I loved acting so much. And I was like, my mom was always like, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah, it you know, always, that it old adage. Feel like work. Right. Sometimes. It does. Sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> a lot of times. But the act of acting does not. It yeah. feels like I'm obsessed. Yeah. And then I found myself, I, you know, grew up in the, grew up as an actor, as an adult actor in mm. the regional theater circuit before I went to grad school. Mm. And doing like I was an apprentice at the Actors Theater of Louisville. Yes. And so, and my university theater was a Lord D theater as well. So we got to play parts that had no lines, but it was cool. <laughs> and but that, but my goal was to be this like regional circuit actor. It was so like interesting you say that. Yes. Yeah, I wanted like a home base somewhere. I assumed it would probably be New York or Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I just had these dreams of working at all these giant um, uh, regional theaters. And then it didn't really, I can't even say like when the thought of Broadway as like a realistic goal, it had to be post grad school, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, it wasn't always my dream. I and that. I think also because I also equated, I think it's harder for actors who don't sing and dance to get yeah, on Broadway. Broadway. And so there was also this feeling of like, it was like this thing that's out there. We're like, maybe when I'm like 45, 50, which is honestly where I thought was gonna happen. Yeah. But so this happening so fast is crazy. But I have to say like Broadway debut, I didn't, I, it wasn't a dream of mine until like more recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, now that you say that I have to, cause my first question was like, my first answer was like, yes, of course, but Again, if I think about what I understood about the industry at different points in my life, it wasn't until recently when I've seen a lot of my peers on Broadway. Girl, say that. And I was like, oh my goodness, she's Tony nominated and mm -hmm. I know her. You know what I mean? Like when I said, oh, these are my peers and they're showing up in these really edgy, interesting plays and these plays are making it to Broadway. I think the shift in atmosphere in terms of what gets produced on Broadway made me think that I could belong there. Mm. I think as a child, I thought, or, you know, as a teenager and as a, you know, a growing up person thought Broadway was Lion King or these, you know, tentpole Same. musicals. And, you know, I kind of feel like I, I missed the boat to like do vocal lessons and things. I, I love all of that stuff, but I kind of honed in on being like a straight actor. Um, and I really didn't think that there would be a play that would feel like, I could fit it until I was maybe older or whatever. And also these these kind of landing, career landings of like, you know, being on Broadway or off-Broadway debut or all of these things, you you don't know how quickly they're going to come and you kind of try to humble yourself and and work hard. And again, I a lot of my mentors and examples, I saw them working a lot regionally mm. and said, okay, so I'm going to go, I'm going to go to grad school. I'm going to do three years of training. I'm going to learn classically and train myself and do all of that stuff. I'll move to New York and try my best but I'll probably end up that'll all uh, honestly end up being the launching pad for me to work at the Guthrie or Berkeley Rep or the Huntington and um wonderful DC Shakes like all these wonderful theaters around the country and I saw myself kind of doing that and when I found myself really working a lot here and that mm. New York has become the place that I've done a lot of my theater professionally and then to end up on Broadway in a show like this that reflects my experience as a black woman from the south um is just kind of mind boggling. I really think it's a, a reflection of what people are interested in seeing now to for it to now have this adjustment mm -hmm. and thought for us that we could be here. Yeah. Um, but it is a dream come true. 
representation is important. Yes. I mean, that's what I that's what I got from what you said about yeah. seeing our so many of our friends um, on Broadway. Yeah. I mean, it's like, oh, this is very possible. It's so possible, actually. From, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. So mm. yeah. Next question. Harlem's fifty-five year old. Oh. Is it me or you? It's you. Harlem's 55-year-old National Black Theater is also making its Broadway debut with Fat Ham. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you to be a part of this landmark moment? Mm. You know, I think about this actually quite a lot. Yeah. Um, I don't have a relationship to MBT outside of Fat Ham, mm -hmm. but so many of my friends have worked there, have worked with them. And not only that, I think a lot about what it'll mean for people who study theater to then study this moment mm -hmm. and to be a part of that. Mm. It's a legacy, it's a legacy that's like just not lost on me. And I don't know necessarily what because we're in it. And I think like once we get out of it and have a bit more of a bird's eye view of mm -hmm. like the the gravity of this, this moment, yeah. I think I'll be able to speak about it a little bit more articulately. But I, you know, I can feel the specialness that's the only word i can think of that's right a now big word. but i that's I, I can i it vibrates with uh, a special energy that i you know i think once this is done and i can breathe a little bit more and see from up top mm -hmm. i think i'll i think i'll have more words about more. it but it, it does feel special that's so nice yeah it's so true it is very special i you know, so many of my friends, like like you said, kind of grew up in NBT. Like that was where they got to train and do um, really wonderful work as black actors in the city. I was so lost when I moved here. I packed four bags almost ten years ago, and I saw readings at NBT. And I and I from that intimidated, intimidated, fearful place then was like. Oh, one day I'll stand up and I'll do a reading with MBT. <laughs> I was like, one day I'll I'll volunteer, I'll email somebody maybe, and and I'll ask them if I could read one of their plays, or you know, they would do these series where they would do excerpts of like black playwrights um, would read an excerpt of their play, but then they have actors come up and read a section of it, but you wouldn't hear the whole thing. And I would go to those, and I was intimidated of that. I was like. I don't think I'm good enough for that, but I like being here in one day in BT. <laughs> so I feel like I kind of was like this like this observer of this beautiful institution in Harlem, um, but never really got, never really initiated myself or took the initiative to be in that space. And so mm -hmm. now to kind of interject with NBT at this important moment is really incredible. Again, I think- Full circle. Full circle for me. Um, I mean, I thought about it when I auditioned. I said, wow, this would be my first time auditioning for people from NBT. Like mm -hmm. I was thinking about that and the public. And I, I was like, that. these are places I've wanted to work at. Um, and that was a big draw, I think, in addition to the play being so wonderful to to participate in this play. Um, so to for us to be here now, to know that this is the third play in history to come from a Black theater to end up on Broadway, I hadn't thought about how this moment would be studied later or be a part of an anthology. Like, I wonder what people will say about this period of theater from the early 2000s to 2020 or whatever the mm -hmm. the, the bracket of time will be. And to feel like that I'm a part of that is, and that we're a part of that, mm -hmm. is in, is incredibly special. It is, and I I will have more words as well when when it, when we're at, away from it and we're reflecting and yeah. on the 20th anniversary of Fat Ham. And... Did you know that there is an MFA program that studies just Black theater? Oh my goodness! Um, in Louisville at the University of Louisville. Really? In Kentucky? Yeah, yeah. I wish I went. Pretty cool. Yeah, wow. Next question. There, yes, I'm not, <laughs> there are some wonderfully raucous scenes during uh, Fat Ham's Backyard Barbecue. Have there ever been any amusing onstage mishaps? I know what you're going to say. What am I going to say with the balloon? No. No. I thought you were going to talk about the Capri Sun moment. Were you on stage for it? What? Tell me. Now we have to hear it. Now you have to answer well, the question first. <laughs> I don't think anything crazy hap has happened yet. Okay. Do you disagree? No, I don't. There's been some things that have happened. Yeah. Well, one moment I thought I missed my entrance. <laughs> <laughs> and I like, it was like, I had already come on stage and then I like, I, I go off with Rev and then Juicy and Tidra are having a scene mm -hmm. on stage. 
and there was like a pause, like a <laughs> heavy beat. Like a long. And I grabbed those mason jars so quick and I walked by the window and I was like, this is not my cue. And so I just like kept walking. <laughs> it was so weird. I didn't know that happened. It wow. was so funny. But there was like a moment at the public where either you or Marcel dropped a Capri Sun, somebody stepped on it and it squirted, squirted on everywhere. Soap. It probably was mine. Because Probably. I could never finish the Capri Sun. Oh, it's just right. too much. It's juice. It's, it's sugar. Sweet. It's a lot. Yeah. So I would put it under the table so that it would be out of the way. And I think during the Rev Pap, I mean, the, the Rev scene that we won't get into, it got stepped on and squirted everywhere. <laughs> so now we do something completely different where I have a Capri Sun that has nothing in it <laughs> because I can't be responsible for drinking a whole Capri Sun on stage. <laughs> um BTS. Yeah, a little BTS. Um, what another raucous moment? I think it's so fun. There's a moment where Marcel and I are on microphones, and I won't speak too much about it, but truly, oh, hello. Um, but truly, Marcel is like such a so he's so locked in with the audience. It's mm -hmm. one of his gifts. He really knows how to ride the audience to curate the experience and so on any given day he might say something different yeah. <laughs> and one day he said something different in response to me and we are we are allowed to we have some set ad libs in the show and so he ad libbed i thought it was funny i broke a little bit the audience laughed and then i was so like energetically shook by that because <laughs> when something's different it just shakes your whole spirit you're like oh my god it's different it's not the same thing. I'm not on autopilot anymore. I'm not that we're ever on autopilot, but just things, you know, the, the expectations have been shifted. So then he said something funny. I broke a little bit. We continued the scene. I get to the next beat where I speak to my mother and I don't know what came out of my mouth. The line that I was supposed to say and what came out were different. And I was like, oh my God, I completely messed up this line. Just get back in, get back in Adriana. Just stay in the scene and get to the next beat, the next beat. Cause you know, the audience normally doesn't even know what to expect. So I'm like stuck in the moment that I feel like was wrong or different because everything felt so, <laughs> so, you know, you just gotta be ready. Or when Benja does something crazy and oh, she's been God. doing, she's been sparing us on Broadway, but off yeah. Broadway, she would just do the wildest stuff and I would break almost every performance. And that is so unprofessional, but she would just catch me off guard every single time. Well, she would like lose her shoe. She <laughs> Like, or she would do, she started to do something with Rev with the tablecloth. Like she's just a comedic genius. She really is. So she if you let Benja go and do her thing, you'll never get through the it's play. It's a show, it'll write itself. It'll just write itself. So oh. many times I've been I've been caught laughing on stage because I was just like, wow. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. So a lot of unexpected things do happen in our show. Very much so. Very much. Yeah. Next question. Is she? Is it me? Is it yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fat Ham's delicious mix of comedy and tragedy elicits audible responses. It does. Mm -hmm. What are your most <laughs> memorable audience yeah. reactions? Yes. Uh, yeah. I. So, I'm having a different experience. I, you know, in 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 some way, in many ways, I think. But there, I don't want to give things away. But oh, there's a right. moment, there's yes. just like um, mm -hmm. moments that are so, that I have that are so heated or so like heavy and sensitive. Mm -hmm. And there will be like laughter. There, it, it doesn't, it's not everyone by any means. It's always like you can hear like a handful of people laughing or like there's this one very charged moment and people will be like, yeah, yeah, get him, get him, juicy. And I'm like, are what is happening here? Mm -hmm. It can be um really disconcerting, but my feelings about it have changed dramatically mm. to where like I used to be inconsolable even on stage every once in a while. But this one mm -hmm. and Marcel were who plays Juicy were wonderful and always had my back. Um, and they recognize that like it. I mean, yeah, the experience it that you. it gets, it can be really kind of frightening mm -hmm. that people have whatever thoughts that they're having to elicit that kind of response. Mm. 
And, uh, but now I feel much more, I don't know, like I've healed whatever parts of myself that felt insecure about those moments. Mm. And I can also be like, at the same time, I'm like, these people are having an experience based on their own given circumstances, yes. based on their own experiences. And they may not be um, in a place that's best suited for um, this play right now. Like yeah. how would be, what would be ideal? But I also want them to have their own experience, yeah. which I think is like real. And I think it's like an emotional learning curve for a lot of people. And to be honest, mm. to me, those are the people that I want in the audience more than anybody exactly. else. Exactly. It's like you're on the front lines. It's like these are the people that you want to reach, not the people who already agree with how we want them to respond exactly. necessarily. Exactly. Without and, giving anything away. And without giving anything away, I think we get them. Yeah. You do. I do. <laughs> Especially, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh. You know, I think the play has a score. It's almost like a musical. It's almost like a piece of music because we start to, we really rely on the audience in this play and we listen to the audience so much. So much of what I do before I come on stage is really to listen to the play and how people are responding because it's such a, it's such a call and response kind of play. Many black playwrights encourage that. Dominique Mariso would be one um, in addition to James Imes. And so I think I'm always looking for it. I'm always excited about hearing the, oohs and the ahs. It's almost like those are the beats that sometimes when we don't get them, we're like, okay, the show still has integrity. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. But when we get that, like something is revealed or someone says something really saucy or something said something is really funny and we get the, ooh, like it'll be odd. like the entire audience will have this unanimous experience where they'll respond in the same way, mm -hmm. you know, not everybody, but a, a majority of people. And it kind of like propels us forward. Like it becomes like, the rest to the triplets that we're playing. We're playing mm. the music and then we'll get something from the audience and it changes. It's like a score. So I think it's never unpredictable or un like we're looking for it. And it's it's a big part of the experience. I think also you come on two different nights, you get different audiences. You may see the same play, yeah. but have a completely different experience. Um, yeah. yeah. Next question. Last question. Be each other's casting directors. What role would you put the other in? Okay, so you go first. <laughs> I would put you in for theater, mm -hmm. Measure for Measure, Isabella. Yes, which you would also love to play. I would love to play Isabella. You'd I would amazing. also love to play Claudio across from you. Oh, my God. And I would also like to see you play Emily in Our Town, which you have already done, yeah. as well as play Isabella. Oh. Uh, but and I also would like to play Emily, Emily in, our, in town. our Town. So you're giving me all the roles that you want to play. This is true. Now, <laughs> I would also love to see you in something like Atlanta Ooh, on FX. Yes. I would love to see you in, um, I love Dominique Fishback. I would like to have seen what you could have done with Swarm. Ooh. I think that would be my wild card. Yeah, that would you be know? like a, something different. Like so, uh, I would be like, I would want to challenge you with this. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh wow, that's so... Man. And I feel like you would be great in a period piece, but how the Brits do it, Mm -hmm. So like putting black people in Elizabethan times or you know Victorian so times. I would love to do all that stuff. You're so you're so on the money. My goodness. I actually once had a casting director, Ellen, something. I can't remember her last name. She goes, I think you'd be a great casting director. And I was like, because you understand people's energies and you kind of, oh, yeah, yeah. this is a great question for Calvin. And My goodness. Me yeah, I mean, we'll see. Wow. But I love acting. You do. We both love acting. Yeah. We're so passionate about it. So oh, for, you, for, me? Me, me, me. For, <laughs> for you, I would, I said, I, I think you would be really, really, really brilliant. One of my favorite shows, Abbott Elementary. Um, there's something about the dryness of your humor because you don't realize how funny you are. And that you just kind of deliver things and then you look back and you're like, what? <laughs> and I think there's something about that show that's like direct delivery and then commentary push in after. And I just think you would be brilliant. I just would love to see you in that world um, on, a, on, an, like an, on an ABC network show. I just think that would be great. And I agree with everything that you said because I wish I had thought of more theater. Um, I, I, I think I would love to see an, a completely like different interpretation of of um of these plays that you mentioned of like measures for measure and our town and seeing mm -hmm. you play the leads of these plays would be gorgeous because you just have such a poetic soul 
um, and your and your ability to access language and and lift it, and so that we can all feel it and not just hear it and hear pretty words, but feel it. I think is another one of your gifts. And so, from a theater perspective, anything that has some really gorgeous language, um, you're hired. <laughs> Adriana, that was so sweet. That's what I would say. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so glad I'm playing your brother. Ooh. I know, it's so great. Do we have any more questions? This is fun. Oh, oh, TDF, you, thank TDF. you so much. Thank you. This was definitely like sitting with us in the booth because we were all over the place. I know, right? Or like me popping in your dressing room <laughs> like, and being like, I'm closing the door. We're talking about something. So yes, thank you so much for having us. Um, and come see Fat Ham Please at the American Airlines Ham. Theater on 42nd Street. Yeah. Bye, Bye thank, thank you. you.